For the last several weeks, we have been going through the book of Hebrews. This is the last sermon in our Hebrew series. We're all the way to Hebrews chapter 13. We're to the last chapter in the book. Um, Hebrews is an amazing book, and it's different in many different ways. It is the only book in the New Testament that's actually written in the Hebrew language. The rest of the books are written in either Aramaic or Greek. Um, there are several books in the Old Testament that are written in Hebrew, but this is the only one in the New Testament. And it was done on purpose because if you really wanted to get a Jew's attention, you spoke in Hebrew. And that's exactly what the author here is trying to do. This book was written to Jewish Christians and to encourage them not to give up on their faith. And so five times in the book, the author of Hebrews will encourage will stop what he's doing and encourage them not to give up on their faith, not to turn back on their faith. He talks about how uh, Christianity is superior, how uh, Jesus is superior to angels, and how he's superior to the law and to Moses, and how he's superior to the priesthood and to Aaron. And um, he talks about faith and all of these things that are there talks about uh, Jesus role not on earth anymore but in heaven and how Jesus sacrifice was not made in the earthly temple in Jerusalem but that his sacrifice he offered his blood in the more perfect temple the temple that is in heaven and how the temple and the tabernacle here on earth were just copies imperfect copies of what actually exists in heaven. And so as we come to the conclusion, as we come to the end of the book of Hebrews, we just have some kind of housekeeping stuff, some, some stuff where either Apollos or Paul or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews here is just encouraging them with some final encouragements, and we're going to look at those this morning. So if you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13, I want to read verses 1 through 17. It says this, Keep on loving each other as brothers, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders who, spoo who, <laughs> who spoke sorry, the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace that he bore. For here we do, we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come, the new Jerusalem. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. 
just a lot of practical things that the author here of Hebrews brings out. And so we're going to break several of these things down, but we're going to break them down into two categories. So the first category that we're going to deal with are social duties for the Christian. Those things that um, we're called to do socially as we interact with each other. So the first point is social duties for the Christian. Social duties for the Christian. The first area that he mentions underneath that is brotherly love in verse 1. Verse 13, 1 says, Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. We're reminded that uh, Jesus said that the world would know that we are his disciples by the way that we love one another. It's not the building that sets us apart as Christians. It's not, you know, um, the ceremonies that we go through, the fact that we light candles at the communion table. Jesus said it was by our love for one another that the world would know that we belonged to him. And then Jesus went even farther And he told us that we're not just to love those people that love us back, but we're to love everyone. That we're to even love our enemies. And that's hard to do. But see, that's what sets us apart. Because God wants us to be like him. And God loves people unconditionally. He doesn't love us based off of our performance, based off of our personality, based off of the way that we look. Thank goodness, or I'd be in big trouble, right? God loves us simply because we are. And God doesn't stop loving us even when we do unlovable things. Now, it grieves him. It makes him very sad when we do those things, but it doesn't make him stop loving us. And sometimes I think until you become a parent, it's hard to understand that kind of love. There's been times when my kids have done things that made me want to just ooze into a crack in the ground but it didn't make me stop loving them. I still love my kids unconditionally, even though they sometimes do things that drive me crazy. And that's the way God loves us. And God is calling us to love other people that way. You see, if I really love others... I won't want them to spend the rest of eternity separated from God. And I'll do whatever is necessary to share with them the love of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if we only love those people that love us back, then we're just like the rest of the world. It's our unconditional love for others that makes us like Jesus. And that's what we're called to do. Secondly, it says there that we need to be hospitable. We need hospitality. Hebrews 13, 2 says, Do not neglect showing hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. That's an interesting passage, isn't it? We're called to be, to show hospitality, not just to the people that we like, not just the people that we care about, but to strangers as well. And the author here of Hebrews says that people have actually entertained angels without being aware of it. I thought all angels had wings. Well, there must be some without them. Because I think that'd be a dead giveaway, wouldn't it? It says here that some people have acted.
actually entertained angels unaware. You see, God wants us to love others and to treat them with the respect that they deserve. You know, if we really got these things down, these four things here uh, that kind of we're being socially reminded to do here in the book of Hebrews, we wouldn't be struggling with the things, with the Black Lives Matter issues and some of these other things because we would treat all people the same, just like we want to be treated. The third one here is, is uh, sympathy, verse 3. Sympathy. Don't forget about those in prison. Suffer with them as though you were there yourself. Share the sorrow of those being mistreated as though you feel their pain in your own bodies. Now, um, we need to understand the times in which Hebrews is written. Okay, so what, what the author here of Hebrews is talking about is he's talking about Christian people who are in prison, who are suffering because of their faith. Right? So if we remember our history, there was this guy who was emperor of Rome by the name of Nero, who burned certain kind of slummy parts of Rome, and then when everybody got really upset about it, he blamed the Christians. And that caused this tremendous persecution of the church. Early writers in history said that um, streets were lit at night by Christians who were burned at the stake. Um, Christians were herded into coliseums and wild animals and lions were turned loose on them. Both Peter and Paul will die as martyrs of their faith due to the persecution that results from Nero. Oral tradition, so it isn't actually in Scripture, but what was passed down from one generation to the next, from father to son, so on and so forth, that's oral tradition, tells us that Peter was crucified upside down because he did not feel worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. And oral tradition also tells us <clears throat> that Paul was beheaded, and that was probably because he was a Roman citizen. In one passage of scripture where Paul is imprisoned, he writes and he said he has been delivered from the mouths of the lions. I think that probably what's happened is that it has been decided that he would not be forced into the Colosseum with many other Christian people, probably because of his Roman citizenship. And so we know he didn't die that way. Oral tradition says that he was beheaded for his faith because of his Christianity. So what the author here is writing is he's saying that we should have sympathy. We should struggle right along with those who are suffering for their faith in prison. So with that in mind, let me read that verse one more time. It says, don't forget about those in prison. Suffer with them as though you were there yourself. Share the sorrow of those being mistreated as though, you're feel, as though you feel the pain in your own bodies. This is not people who are there because they deserve to be there. This is people who are there unjustly because of their faith. Now, does that mean that we should just ignore people who have gone to prison? No. God loves those people too. Remember I said God loves people unconditionally. And just and even though they are in prison, God still loves them. He still offers them forgiveness from their sins if they accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Now, does that make the consequences of their sin go away? Absolutely not. You know, um, a person can accept Jesus Christ as their Savior in prison. They're still going to serve their term, whatever that term is, right? 
and that's that's fair that's just right um but to just ignore those people those people need jesus just as much as the rest of the world maybe even more so and sometimes i think we're guilty of just ignoring those people who have gone away to prison and somehow we feel like they're not worthy of the gospel message but that's just not true and then um, fidelity in your marriage. Fidelity in your marriage. Hebrews 13.4. It says, Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Man, it seems like the times that we live in, that this encouragement couldn't be more timely. Because we live in a society where pornography and a casual attitude towards sex is everywhere. But God intended it for it to be special. Something that was reserved between a husband and a wife. And Paul in Corinthians will say that sexual sin is not like every other sin. Every sin is the same in that it violates God's law, right? It is God's law that is broken. It is God's law that we have rejected whenever we sin, regardless of what it is, whether it's, you know, telling lies, whether it's stealing, whether it's murder. But Paul says in Corinthians that sexual sin is different. He says, because all other sin happens outside of the body, Sexual sin happens with the body. And uh, Paul separates it a little bit in that way. That doesn't mean that that kind of sin can't be forgiven. But in a marriage, that kind of intimacy, when that intimacy is broken, it's hard for it to be restored. And so the author here of Hebrews encourages us to remain faithful to the one that we have pledged our life to. And then he says contentment. He encourages us to be content. In Hebrews 13, 5 through 6, it says this, Keep your lives free from the love of money and content with what you have, because God has said, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you you know in america contentment is probably one of the most difficult things because the world is our society is constantly telling us that we need more we need a better house we need more money we need you know um, not just a car but we need a really nice car because all of those things are status symbols. But the author here of Hebrews says to be content with what we have. The thing, when someone passes away, like Wayne did, this early, early this morning, what it always reminds me of is this. When you came into this world, you came with nothing. And when you leave this world, you can take nothing with you. You leave just exactly the way that you came. And everything that you acquired for yourself instantly belongs to somebody else. You can't take it with you. And... I have been around a lot of people at the end of their life. And I can tell you with certainty this. What is most important to those people when they come to the very end of their life is not the things that they have. It is the people and the relationships that are around them. That is by far the most important thing 
when people come to the end of their life. And what's so very sad is that it takes death for people to finally acknowledge it. Because we spend all of our life bombarded with things and we forget what's really, really, truly important. You see, it's the things that you do for others that really lives on. The lives that you impact Have you ever spent your life doing something that you thought was really important only when you come to the conclusion of it find that you were chasing after exactly the wrong thing? When we used to do these youth events, um, when I was a lot younger, we had this game that we played. And in this game, you got the kids together and you sat them down and you said, the goal of this game is you gave them this sheet and it had all of these things that they had to accomplish. So there was all of these different centers. There's the learning center. There's the, the I don't know, what we called it, the physical center. There was the laughing center. There's like these five different areas that they would go to. And in each of these areas, there was like five things that you had to do. So you go to the learning center and they'd ask you these questions. And if you could get the answer to that question, they'd sign on that line. And then you would go to the, to the uh, physical center or the health center, wherever it was, and you do so many sit-ups and so many push-ups, and so, and they would sign this line, and you go to the laughing center, and you'd have to tell a joke, and they would sign the line, and the, all of these things, and it was the, it was their success story, and if they could get all the way to the bottom of the sheet, they were successful. They would win the game, right? Well, the helpers were told very different things. And you had these people that would constantly encourage you to go faster and to do more and to be successful and to finish this sheet. And then they and they were they were false prophets, right? We didn't tell the kids about these people. And then there were these other guys, and they were the prophets, and their job was to get you to trade your success story for a death certificate. And they would take your success story and they would write your name on this paper. It said this so-and-so has died to the success story and then the prophet would sign it. And you'd start out and so as, and you're trying to build up all of this hype, all of this excitement and you're trying to get the kids to hurry. So, and so the, in the centers, you're purposely going slow to try and get them more and more worked up, right? And and um, and at each of these centers, you got these people saying, "Come on, you can do this. You can do this." And the other people saying, "No, you don't need to do this. Here, take my death certificate, right?" And you tell them that the game is over when they hear the trumpet sound. And so, um, you have some people that, you know, believe that they need the death certificate. You have other people that when they see there's no possible way they're going to complete the, the success story, they give up and they take the death certificate. So, you know, um, and then there's those people that are just, you know, I've got to win. I've got to win. I've got to win. I've got to win. And at the very end, you blow the trumpet and everybody comes upstairs and you separate them and the people who have the death certificate go to one side and the people with their success story goes to the other side. And then you read from scripture where Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. And he puts the sheep on the one side and the goats on the other. And he says to the goats, depart from me. 
for I never knew you. And to the sheep he says, enter into my rest. And all of these kids are suddenly struck with the fact that what they have been trying to do for the last 45 minutes, what they so thought was right, ended up being completely wrong. But is that not exactly what happens in our world today? Is that not the exact same thing that goes on in our world each and every day where the world tells us that what we need is to be successful and prestigious and to have all of this stuff and be successful? And Jesus says, no, all you really need is me. Die to yourself so that you can live with me. And when we step into eternity, it's going to be exactly like that game because we're going to be separated like sheep and goats. And the people who have bought into the world and its standard will go away. And the people who have died to themselves and accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior will inherit heaven and eternity. We need to be content. Man, I've got to hurry. I'm just about out of time and I'm only halfway through. Okay, so we've got to go a lot faster here. The second is religious duties. Religious duties for the Christian. The first is follow spiritual leaders. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember your leaders who taught God's message to you. Remember how they lived and died. Copy their faith. And so I think there's a couple of really important things as we look here. That is that we as Christian people have a responsibility to follow our spiritual leaders. Those who are the elders in our church. Those who are instructing us. But then there's also, I think, a tremendous responsibility here for those who are leaders in our church. For our ministers and for our elders. Um, because it says they're, they are encouraged to follow our example. And so those of us who are leaders, we have a tremendous responsibility to make sure that we are doing it in right. So that we, like Paul can say, the Apostle Paul, we can say, follow my example even as I am following the example of Jesus Christ. A good leader doesn't push from behind. A good leader leads by example and tries to make people like him or her. Right? Moving on. Be steadfast in doctrine. Hebrews 13, 8 and 9 says, Christ Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not let all kinds of strange teachings lead you into the wrong way. Your heart should be strengthened by God's grace, not by obeying the rules about foods which do not help those who obey them. This, I think, is a particularly important admonition, especially in our time, because I think that there's a tremendous pressure for the church to become politically correct. I'm sorry, but this has been around a lot longer than the United States of America has been around, and certainly longer than our current society has been around. Because the societal norms of our day are not the same societal norms that they were 50 years ago or 100 years ago, right? And they will change again. But what's in this book does not change. It does not change. And you can deny truth all that you want to deny it, but it does not change what is true. Are you with me here on this? I can say that the, that the sun revolves around the earth. And that it, the earth is the center of the universe. I can say it. I can absolutely believe it. But am I right? Nope. <laughs> I'm not. Because, you know, we know better. I can say that, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I can say that <clears throat> um, I can live however I want to live and it doesn't make any difference. Is that true based off of what this book has to say? No, it is not. And it doesn't matter how many people say it. 
It doesn't matter how many people parrot a lie. It does not make it true. I'm a practical guy. I grew up in the Midwest. I come from, you know, a farm community. Um, I struggle with some of the things that I see today. You know, people that claim that they can be whatever gender they want to be just by saying it. A farmer knows that you are what you were born with. That's just the way it is. And you can have all kinds of surgeries, but it doesn't change your chromosomal makeup. You either came with an X and a Y, or you came with two X's. And you can change the packaging, but you can't change the genetics. We can say what I can, I can say that I'm a woman all day long is not going to change my genetic code. Now, I can, I, can, I can be sympathetic toward them, but it doesn't change the truth. And I, there's a lot of areas in our life where we just deny the truth and we think that it will become true if we deny it enough. You can't change the truth. The truth remains the truth no matter how many people choose to believe the lie. The scripture is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what I think about it does not make one bit of difference. I can say God doesn't really mean what he says, but does that change the truth? Does my lie that God doesn't really mean what he says change the truth at all? No. And I can guarantee you this, regardless of whatever has been proclaimed from this pulpit or any pulpit around the world, you will be judged by what is in this book. This is the standard by which the entire world and every person who has ever lived on it will be judged. And so it's important that we know what's in it. Thirdly, we're to be separate from the world. We're not to be like the rest of the world. Hebrews 13, 10 through 14. We have an altar from which the priests in the temple on earth have no right to eat. Under the system of Jewish laws, the high priest brought the blood of animals into the holy place as a sacrifice for sin, but the bodies of the animals were burned outside the camp. So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates in order to make his people holy by shedding his own blood. So let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the disgrace he bore, for this world is not our home. We're looking forward to our city in heaven, which is yet to come. And just really quickly, the point that he's trying to make is that inside the temple, in the holy place, there was the table of showbread. And only the priests were allowed to eat the bread on that table. G, uh, the author here of Hebrews is saying that um, we have an altar from which the priests, the earthly priests, the priests in Jerusalem, have no right to eat. And that um, we're not a part of this world. We're only passing through. That our real home is in heaven. I've got to go on. Priestly service. Uh, fourth is priestly service. Hebrews thirteen fifteen through 16. With Jesus' help, let us continually offer our sacrifice of praise to God by proclaiming the glory of his name. Don't forget to do good and to share what you have with those in need. For such sacrifices are very pleasing to God. You know, in the Old Testament system, you brought your, your uh, bull or your goat or your sheep or your lamb, and you sacrificed that, and then you were done. You know, the kind of sacrifice that Hebrews is talking about is not a blood sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of praise, where we praise God. It's a sacrifice of, of doing, of helping those who are in need. 
And it says here that those sacrifices are very pleasing to God. Have you ever worked really, really hard and then not been appreciated for it? Kind of stinks, doesn't it? Um, but doesn't it mean so much when somebody comes up to you and says, thank you so much for what you've done. That means so much to me. It makes it all kind of seem worthwhile, doesn't it? Don't you think that for God, once in a while, he loves to hear us say thank you? Thank you for giving me this awesome planet to live on. Thank you for giving me your son, Jesus, who showed me how to live and died on the cross so that I could spend forever with you. Sometimes we need to make sure that we thank him and praise him for what he's done for us. And then finally, um, we need to be obedient and submissive to both spiritual and regular authority that's around us. Hebrews 13, I, 7. I know in the sermon notes it says 13, 8, but it actually should be 13, 7. It says this, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. For that would be of no advantage to you. You know, I don't care who you are. You're always going to be subject to somebody else's authority. Even the President of the United States is subject to the sentence, to the Senate. And we just saw that as we went through an impeachment thing, right? Um, he has people to which he also has to answer to. So even if you're president, even if you're president of the United States, you know, I don't care who you are, you're always going to be subject to somebody else's authority. Even if you happen to be king of the entire world, you're still subject to God. And I think one of the things, really valuable things that we can teach our children is that the sooner that you learn to submit to authority, the easier your life is going to be. Because there's always going to be somebody if it's not mom and dad, it's a teacher or a professor at school or a police officer or a judge or your boss. There's always going to be something. And the sooner that we learn to submit to the authority that's around us, the better our life is going to be. Right? I think part of the struggle that we have in our society today is because we have people that are really struggling with authority in general. They don't want to submit to anybody at all. And that makes life for them very difficult. If I can't submit to the spiritual leadership in my church, if I can't submit to the authority of my government, as long as it doesn't violate this, right? As long as it doesn't violate this, if I can't submit to them, how can I expect myself to submit to the, uh, the creator of all? Are you with me? If I can't submit to my parents' authority, how can I possibly submit to my heavenly father's authority? And so we're encouraged to be obedient and submissive to authority. And you notice there that kind of that very last part, it says, obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. And then there's also kind of this one other little reminder, and that is this, that um, they will have to answer for the authority that they're in. The Bible says, let not many of you be teachers, knowing that you will incur upon yourself stricter judgment. In other words, you know, for those of us who are in authority positions in the church, we're going to have more to answer for. And so the idea there is, is not to just jump into it lightly. So we have several things that there we've been encouraged to do. But you know, the very first and most important step is to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, because that's where we have to begin. This morning, we're going to offer an invitation hymn. And if you've not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, we offer you that opportunity to do so.